Welcome, welcome, welcome to your wonderful, spiritual, soulful morning. Let's start our wonderful morning by bowing in gratitude, by folding our hands and feeling the presence of our angels, guardians, gurus, teachers, ancestors and the divine beings in and around us, that surround us, that continue to look over us, guide us, guard us, energize us, inspire us, motivate us to move forward. Let's be grateful for that eternal presence. Let's thank them for the direction, for the nudging, for bringing the cosmic divinities unfolding for being connected with us. When we are lost, getting us back on tracks one way or another. For supporting us in our inner journey. Let's be tuned inwards for all the wonderful things that are unfolding around us, to be aware of them. Let's be grateful to so much that's there in our life. And today morning, let's recount the 10 blessings that we can count now or of yesterday within the next 100 seconds. You can use the power of lotus gratitude or anything that you're comfortable counting on your fingers. May we count on our blessings every time, especially when we are not in a very good zone. May we be reminded organically, not only our higher self reminding us, but us being aware that whatever energy we are living in, If we keep talking about that, that will expand so much more. Now, whether this energy that we're giving is negative or positive, whatever it is will expand. So whatever we don't wish to talk about or don't want in our life, it's best to override that with something that is present in our life. Suppression is not the key. But counterwriting or changing our energy is the key. So whenever we are low, maybe we inspire to listen to something that changes our energy. Or meet somebody who changes our energy. Or see somebody who changes our energy. It's we who are the co-creators of our life. It's easier said than done. But if we start implementing the goodness, the quality of our lives change. By now, all of us are aware, once again, that love is eternal. Love is all that there is. Love is the only language that heart understands and the people understand. And all the material riches 
which we can acquire with a lot of stress will remain in this materialistic world when we leave this human body. We are made from five elements. We will merge back into five elements. But love is the only emotion that is. And this love stays with us forever. Even the people that we love keep reincarnating with us in different roles, different lifespans. So let's become the better versions of ourselves every day, in every part of our living. Enrich ourselves spiritually that any kind of detriments in the physical life, in the human life, will not shake us and break us. They will only be there to enhance the quality of our lives. Because we shall become aware of why they're coming. Spirituality is the only way to live a life. Because it makes us understand why we are who we are and the way we are. And when we know ourselves the best, then we don't need anybody to make us understand. Because you know the soul level, the soul journey. What is it all about? Now let's pray. Hold it hands once again. Bless your entire body and awaken to a beautiful morning of a wonderful book, namely Many Lives, Many Masters, authored by Dr. Brian Wise.
who we reading these past uh past month for now and this wonderful book is one of the very beautiful openings into somebody into a client actually and that's how it began chapter number 1 The first time I saw Catherine, she was wearing a vivid crimson dress, and was nervously leafing through a magazine in my waiting room. She was visibly out of breath. For the previous twenty minutes, she had been pacing the corridor outside the Department of Psychiatry offices, trying to convince herself to keep her appointment at, with me and not run away. I went out to the waiting room to greet her. We shook hands and noticed that hers were cold and damp. confirming her anxiety actually it had taken her two months of courage gathering to make an appointment to see me even though she had strongly been advised to seek my help by two staff physicians both of whom she trusted finally she was here catherine is an extraordinarily attractive woman with medium length blonde hair and hazel eyes at that time she worked as a laboratory technician in the hospital where i was chief of psychiatry and she earned extra money modeling swimwear i ushered her into my office past the couch and to a large leather chair we sat across from each other my semicircular desk separating us catherine leaned back in her chair silent not knowing where to begin i waited preferring that she chose the opening I should choose the opening. After a few minutes, I began inquiring about her past. On that first visit, we began to unravel who she was and why she had come to see me. In answer to my questions, Catherine revealed the story of her life. She was a middle child, reared in a conservative Catholic family in a small Massachusetts town. Her brother, born three years earlier than she. was very athletic and he enjoyed a freedom that she was never allowed a younger sister was the favorite of both parents when she started to talk about her symptoms she began she became noticeably more tense and nervous her speech was rapid and she leaned to a forward resting her elbow on the desk her life had always been burdened with fears she feared water feared choking to the extent that she could not swallow pills feared airplanes feared the dark and she was terrified of dying in the recent past her fears had began to worsen in order to feel safe she often slept in the walk-in closet in her apartment she suffered two or three hours of insomnia before being able to fall asleep once asleep she would l- sleep lightly and fitfully awakening frequently the nightmares and sleep walking episodes that had plagued her childhood were returning as her fears and symptoms increasing paralyzed her she became more and more depressed as catherine continued to talk i could sense how deeply she was suffering over the years i had helped many patients like catherine through the agonies of their fears and i felt confident that i could help her too I decided we would begin by delving into her childhood looking for an original source of her problems usually this kind of insight helps to alleviate anxiety if necessary and if she could manage to swallow pills i would offer her some mild anti anxiety medications to make her more comfortable this was standard textbook treatment for catherine's symptoms and i never hesitated to use tranquilizers or even antidepressant medicines to treat treat chronic severe fears and anxieties now i use his medicines more sp- much more sparingly and only temporarily if at all no medicines can reach the real roots of these symptoms my experience with catherine and others like her have proved this to me now i know there can be cures not just suppression or covering of symptoms During the first session, I kept trying to gently nudge her back to her childhood because Catherine remembered amazingly few events from her early years. I made a mental note to consider hypnotherapy as a possible shortcut to overcome this repression. She could not remember any particularly 
traumatic moments in her childhood that could explain the epidemic of fears in her life. As she strained and searched her mind to remember, isolated memory fragments emerged. When she was about five years old, she had panicked when someone had pushed her off a diving board into a swimming pool. She said that even before that incident, however, she had never felt comfortable in water. When Catherine was 11, her mother had become severely depressed. Her mother's strange withdrawal from the family necessitated visits to a psychiatrist with, uh, with ensuing electroshock treatments. These treatments had made it difficult for her mother to remember things. This experience with her mother frightened Catherine. But as her mother improved and became herself again, Catherine said that her fears dissipated. Her father had a long-standing history of alcohol abuse and sometimes Catherine's brother had to retrieve their father from the local bar. Her father's increasing alcohol consumption led to his having frequent fights with her mother, who would then become moody and withdrawn. However, Catherine viewed this as an accepted family pattern. Things were better outside the home. She dated in high school and mixed in easily with her friends, most of whom she had known for many years. However, she found it difficult to trust people, especially those outside her small circle of friends. Her religion was simple and unquestioned. She was raised to believe in traditional Catholic ideology and practices, and she had never really doubted the truthfulness and validity of her faith. She believed that if she were a good Catholic and lived properly by observing the faith and its rituals, you would be rewarded by going to heaven. If not, you would experience purgatory or hell. A patriarchal god and his son made these final decisions. I later learned that Catherine did not believe in reincarnation. In fact, she knew very little about the concept. Although she had read sparingly about the Hindus, Reincarnation was an idea contrary to her upbringing and understanding. She had never read any metaphysical or occult literature. Having had no interest in it, she was secure in her beliefs. After high school, Catherine completed a two-year technical program, emerging as a laboratory technician. Armed with the profession and encouraged by her brother's move to Tampa, Catherine landed a job in Miami at a large teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Miami School of Medicine. She moved to Miami in the spring of 1974 at the age of 21. Catherine lived in a small town, had been easier than her life in Miami turned out to be, yet she was glad she had fled her family problems. During her first year, Catherine met Stuart, married, Jewish, with two little children. He was totally different from any other man she had ever dated. He was a successful physician, strong and aggressive. There was an irresistible chemistry between them, but their affair was rocky and temptuous. Something about him drew out her passions and awakened her, as if she were charmed by him. At the time Catherine started therapy, her affair with Stuart was in its sixth year and very much alive, if not well. Catherine could not resist Stuart, Although he treated her poorly and she was furious at his lies, broken promises and manipulations. Several months prior to her appointment with me, Catherine had required vocal cord surgery for a benign nodule. She had been anxious prior to the surgery but was absolutely terrified upon wakening in the recovery room. It took hours for the nursing staff to calm her. After her recovery in the hospital, she sought our Dr. Edward Poole. Ed was a kind pediatrician whom Catherine had met while working in the hospital. They had both felt an instant rapport and they developed a close friendship. Catherine talked freely to Ed, telling him of her fears, her relationship with Stuart, and that she felt she was losing control over her life. He insisted that she make an appointment with me and on only me, not with any of my associate psychiatrists. When Ed called to tell me about his referral, he explained that for some reason he thought only I could truly understand Catherine, even though she, even though other psychiatrists also had excellent credentials and were skilled therapists. Catherine did not call me, however. 
eight weeks passed. In the crunch of my busy practice as head of the Department of Psychiatry, I had forgotten about Ed's call. Catherine's fears and phobias worsened. Dr. Frank Acker, Chief of Surgery, had known Catherine casually for years and they often bantered good-naturedly when he visited the lab where she worked. He had noticed her recent unhappiness and sensed her tension. Several times he had meant to say something to her, but hesitated. One afternoon, Frank was driving to a smaller out-of-the-way hospital to give a lecture. On the way, he saw Catherine driving to her home, which was close to that hospital, and impulsively waved her to the side of the road. I want you to see Dr. Wise now. He yelled through the window, no delays. All those surgeons often act impulsively. Even Frank was surprised at how emphatic he was. Catherine's panic attack and anxiety were increasing in frequency and duration. She began having two recurrent nightmares. In one, a bridge collapsed while she was driving across it. Her car plunged into the water below and she was trapped and drowning. In the second dream, she was trapped in a pitch black room, stumbling and falling over things, unable to find a way out. Finally, she came to see me. At the time of my first session with Catherine, I had no idea that my life was about to turn upside down, that the frightened, confused woman across the desk from me would be the catalyst and that I would never be the same again. Chapter number two. 18 months of intensive psychotherapy passed with Catherine coming to see me once or twice a week. She was a good patient, verbal, capable of insights and extremely eager to get well. During that time, we explored her feelings, thoughts and dreams. Her recognition of recurrent behavior patterns provided her with insight and understanding. She remembered many more significant details from her past, such as her merchant seaman father's absences from the home, his occasional violent outbursts of drinking too much. She understood much more about her turbulent relationship with Stuart and she expressed anger more appropriately. I felt that she should have been much more improved by now. Patients almost always improve when they remember unpleasant influences from their past when they learn to recognize and correct maladaptive behavior patterns. And when they develop insight and view their problems from a larger, more detached perspective, but Catherine had not improved. Anxiety and panic attacks still tortured her. The vivid, recurrent nightmares continued and she was still terrified of the dark of water of being closed in. Her sleep was still fragmenting, fragmented and unrefreshing. She was extremely, uh, uh, she was experiencing heart palpitations. She continued to refuse any medicines, afraid of choking on the pills. I felt as if I had reached a wall and no matter what I did, the wall would remain so high that neither of us would be able to climb over it. But with my sense of frustration came an added sense of determination. Somehow I was going to help Catherine. Now understand the intent behind the entire therapy. 18 months, one and a half year. At least one to two sessions a week. And Dr. Wise is committed that come what may, I will help my patient Catherine. He's not given up, but he's in fact more motivated. And just when he is so sure that come what may, I'll help her, then read the next. A strange thing happened. Although she was intensely afraid of flying and had to fortify her with several drinks while she was on the plane, Catherine accompanied Stuart to a medical conference in Chicago in the spring of 82. While there, she presumed him... Sorry. She pressured, uh, pressured uh, him into visiting the Egyptian exhibit at the Art Museum where they joined a guided tour. Catherine always had an interest in ancient Egyptian artifacts and reproductions of relics from that period. She was hardly a scholar 
and had never studied that time in history. But somehow the faces seemed familiar to her. When the guide began to describe some of the artifacts in the exhibit, she found herself correcting him, and she was right. The guide was surprised. Catherine was stunned. How did she know these things? Why did she feel so strongly that she was right, so sure of herself that she corrected the guide in public? Perhaps the memories are forgotten from her childhood. At the next appointment, she told me that what had happened. Months earlier, I suggested hypnosis to Catherine, but she was afraid that she, and she resisted. Because of experience at the Egyptian exhibit, she now reluctantly agreed. Hypnosis is an excellent tool to help a patient remember long forgotten incidents. There is nothing mysterious about it. It is just a state of focused concentration. Under the instruction of a trained hypnotist, the patient's body relaxes causing the memory to sharpen. I had hypnotized hundreds of patients and found it helpful in reducing anxiety, eliminating phobias, changing bad habits, and aiding in the recall of repressed nature material. On occasion, I had been successful in regressing patients back to their early childhoods, even to when they were two or three years old, thus eliciting the memories of long-forgotten traumas that were disrupting their lives. I felt confident that hypnosis would help Catherine. I instructed Catherine to lie on the couch with her eyes slightly closed and her head resting on a small pillow. At first, we focused on her breathing. With each exhalation, she released stored up tension and anxiety. With each inhalation, she relaxed even more. After several minutes of this, I told her to visualize her muscles progressively relaxing, beginning with the facial muscles and jaw, and then her neck and shoulders, her arms, back and stomach muscles, and finally her legs. She felt her entire body sinking deeper and deeper into the couch. Then I instructed her to visualize a bright white light at the top of her head inside her body. Later on, as I, had the, as I had the light spread slowly down her body, it completely relaxed every muscle, every nerve, every organ, all of her body, bringing her into a deeper and deeper state of relaxation and peace. She felt sleepier and sleepier, more and more peaceful and calm. Even eventually, at my instruction, the light filled her body and surrounded her as well. I counted backwards slowly from 10 to 1. With each number, she entered a deeper level of relaxation. Her trance state deepened. She was able to concentrate on my voice and exclude all background noises. By the count of 1, she was already in a moderately deep state of hypnosis. The entire process had taken about 20 minutes. After a while, I began to regress her, asking her to recall memories of progressively earlier ages. She was able to talk and to answer my questions while, meaning, while maintaining a deep level of hypnosis. She remembered a traumatic experience at the dentist that occurred when she was six years old. She vividly remembered the terrifying experience at age five when she was pushed from a diving board into a pool. She had gagged and choked then, swallowing some water, and while talking about it, she began to gag in my office. I suggested to her that the experience was over and that she was out of the water. The gagging stopped, and she resumed her normal breathing. She was still in a deep trance. At age three, the worst event of all had occurred. She remembered awakening in her dark bedroom and being aware that her father was in her room. He reeked of alcohol then, and she could smell it now. She touched her and rubbed her, even down there. She was terrified and began to cry, so she covered her mouth with his rough hand. She could not breathe. In my office, on my couch, 25 years later, Catherine began to sob. I felt that we had the information now, the key to the lock. I was sure that her symptoms would improve quickly and dramatically. I softly suggested to her that, she, that this experience was over, that she was no longer in her bedroom, but was resting quietly, still in a trance. 
the sobbing ended. I took her forward in time to her current age. I awakened her after I had instructed her by post-hypnotic suggestion to remember all that she had told me. We spent the remainder of the session discussing her suddenly vivid memory of the trauma with her father. I tried to help her accept and integrate her new knowledge. She now understood her relationship with her father, his reactions to her, his aloofness, and a fear of him. She was still shaking when she left the office, but I knew the understanding she had gained was worth the momentary discomfort. In the drama of uncovering her painful and deeply repressed memories, I had entirely forgotten to look for the possible child connection to her knowledge of the Egyptian artifacts, but at least she understood more about her past. She remembered several terrifying events, and I expected her a significant improvement in her symptoms. Despite the new understanding, the next week she reported that her symptoms remained intact as severe as ever. I was surprised. I could not understand what was wrong. Could something have happened earlier than age three? We had uncovered more than sufficient reasons for her fear of choking, of the water, of the dark, of being trapped, and yet the piercing fears and symptoms, the uncontrolled anxiety, were all still devastating her waking moments. Her nightmares were as terrifying as before, decided to regress her further. While hypnotized, Catherine spoke in a low and deliberate whisper. Because of this, I was able to write down her words verbatim and have quoted Catherine directly. The ellipses represent pauses in her speech, not deletions of words, nor editing on my part. However, some of the material that is repetitious is not included here. Slowly, I took Catherine back to the age of two, but she recalled no significant memories. I instructed her firmly and clearly. Go back to the time from where your symptoms arise. I was totally unprepared for what came next. I see white steps leading up to a building, a big white building with pillars open in front. There are no doorways. I'm wearing a long dress, a sack made of rough material. My hair is braided, long blonde hair. I was confused. I wasn't sure what was happening. I asked her what the year was, what her name was. Rhonda, I'm 18. I see a marketplace in front of the building. There are baskets. You carry the baskets on your shoulders. We live in a valley. There is no water. The year is 1863 BC. The area is barren, hot and sandy. There is a well, no rivers, water comes to the valley from the mountains. After she related some topographical details, I told her to go several years ahead in time to tell me what she saw. There are trees and a stone road. I see a fire with cooking. My hair is blonde. I'm wearing a long, coarse brown dress and sandals. I'm 25. I have a girl child whose name is Sclestra. She's Rachel. Rachel is presently her niece. They have always had an extremely close relationship. It's very hot. I was startled. My stomach knotted and the room felt cold. Her visualizations and recall seemed to de so definite. She was not at all tentative. Names, dates, clothes, trees, all seen vividly. What was going on here? How could the child she had then be her niece now? I was even more confused. I'd examined thousands of psychiatric patients, many under hypnosis, and I'd never come across fantasies like this before, not even in dreams. I instructed her to go forward to the time of her death. I wasn't sure how to interview someone in the middle of a, such an explicit fantasy or memory, but I was on the lookout for traumatic events that might underlie current fears or symptoms. Sure. The events around the time of death could be particularly traumatic. Apparently, a flood or tidal wave was devastating the village. There are big waves knocking down trees. There's no place to run. It's cold. The water is cold. I have to save my baby, but I can't. I just have to hold her tight. I drown. The water chokes me. I can't breathe, can't swallow Salty water. My baby is torn out of my arms. Catherine was grasping, gasping and having difficulty breathing. Suddenly, 
her body relaxed completely and her breathing became deep and even. I see clouds. My baby is with me and others from my village. I see my brother. She was resting. This lifetime had ended. She was still in a deep trance. I was stunned. Previous lifetimes? Reincarnation? My clinical mind told me that she was not fantasizing this material, that she was not making this up. Her thoughts, her expressions, her attention to particular details, all were different from her conscious state. The whole gamut of possible psychiatric diagnosis flashed through my mind. But her psychiatrist take and her character structure did not explain this revelation. Schizophrenia? No, she had never had any evidence of cognitive or thinking disorder. She had never experienced any auditory hallucinations of hearing voices, visual hallucinations or visions while awake, or any other type of psychotic episodes. She was not delusional, nor was she out of touch with reality. She did not have multiple or split personalities. There was only one Catherine, and her conscious mind was totally aware of this. She had no sociopathic or antisocial tendencies. She was not an actress. She did not use drugs, nor did she linger, uh, ingest uh, hallucinogenic uh, substances. Her use of alcohol was minimal. She had no neurological or psychological illnesses. Let's explain this vivid, immediate experience while being hypnotized. These were memories of some sort from somewhere. My guy, gut reaction was that I had stumbled upon something I knew very little about. Reincarnation and past life memories. It couldn't be I told myself. My scientifically trained mind resisted it. Yet here it was happening right before my eyes. I couldn't explain it. But I couldn't deny the reality of it either. Go on, I said. A little unnerved but fascinated by what was happening. Do you remember anything else? She remembered fragments of two other lifetimes. I have on a dress with black lace and there is black lace on my head. I have dark hair with grey in it. It's 1756. I am Spanish. My name is Luisa. I'm 56. I am dancing. Others are dancing too. I am sick. I have fever, cold sweats. Lots of people are sick. People are dying. The doctors don't know it was from the water. I took her ahead in time. I recover, but my head still hurts. My eyes and head still hurts from the fever from the water. Many die. Later, she told me that she was a prostitute in that lifetime, but she had not relayed that information because she was embarrassed by it. Apparently, while hypnotized, Catherine could censor some of the memories she transmitted back to me. Since Catherine had recognized her niece in an ancient lifetime, I impulsively asked her if I was a present, if I was present in any of her lifetimes. I was curious about my role, if any, in her remembrances. She responded quickly in contrast to previous very slow and deliberate recall. You are my teacher, sitting on a ledge. You teach us from books. You are old with grey hair. You are wearing a white dress, toga with gold trim. Your name is Diog. You teach us symbols, triangles. You're very wise, but I don't understand this year. It's 1568 BC. This was approximately 1200 years before the noted Greek cynic philosopher Diogenes. The name was not an uncommon one. The first session had ended. Even more amazing ones were yet to come. After Catherine left and over the next several days, I pondered the details of the hypnotic regression. It was natural for me to ponder. Very few details emerging from even a normal therapy hour escaped my obsessive mental analysis and the session was hardly normal. In addition, I was very skeptical about life after death, reincarnation, out-of-body experience and related phenomena. After all, the logical part of me ruminated this could be a fantasy. I wouldn't actually be able to prove any of her assertions or visualizations, but I was also aware, although much more dimly, of a further and less emotional thought. Keep an open mind, thought said. The true science begins with observation. Her memories might not be fantasy or imagination.
they might be something <coughs> more than meets the eye or any of the other senses. Keep an open mind, get more data. I had another nagging thought. Would Catherine, prone to anxieties and fears to begin with, be too frightened to undergo hypnosis again? I decided not to call her. Let her digest the experience too. I would wait until next week. Chapter 3 One week later, Catherine bounced into my office for her next hypnotic session. Beautiful to begin with, she was more radiant than ever. She happily announced that her lifelong fear of drowning had disappeared. Her fears of choking were somewhat diminished. Her sleep was no longer interrupted by the nightmare of a collapsing bridge. Although she had remembered the details of her past life recall, she had not yet truly integrated the material. The concepts of past life and reincarnation were alien to her cosmology, and yet her memories were so vivid, the sights and sounds and smells so clear, the knowledge that she was there, so powerful and immediate that she felt she must have actually been there. She did not doubt this. The experience was overwhelming. Yet she was concerned about how this fit in her upbringing and her beliefs. During the week, I had reviewed my textbook from a comparative religious course taken during my freshman year at Columbia. There were indeed references to incarnation. In the Old and the New Testament, in 8325, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, along with his mother, Helena, had deleted references to reincarnation contained in the New Testament. The Second Council of Constantinople, meeting in AD 553, confirmed this action and declared the concept of reincarnation a hearsay. Apparently, they thought this concept would weaken the growing power of the church by giving humans too much time to seek their salvation. Yet the original references had been there. The early church fathers had accepted the concept of reincarnation. The early Gnostics, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, St. Jerome and many others believed that they had lived before and would again. I, however, had never believed in reincarnation. Actually, I had never really spent much time thinking about it. Although my earlier religious trainings taught about some kind of vague existence of a soul after death, I was not convinced about this concept. I was the oldest of four children, all space three years apart, we belonged to conservative Jewish synagogue in Red Bank, a small town near the New Jersey seashore. I was a peacemaker and statesman in my family. My father was more involved with religion than the rest of us were. He took it very seriously as he took all of for all his life. His children's academic achievements were the greatest joys in his life. He was easily upset by household discord and would withdraw, leaving me to mediate. Although this turned out to be excellent preparatory training for a career in psychiatry, my childhood was heavier and more responsible than in retrospect. I would have preferred. I imagined from it was a very serious young man, one who got used to taking on too much responsibility. I emerged from it a very serious young man, one who got used to taking on too much responsibility. My mother was always expressing her love. No boundary stood in her way. A simpler person than my father, she used guilt, married, uh, married, martyrdom, terminal embarrassment, and vicarious identification with her children as manipulative tools, all without a second thought. Yet she was rarely gloomy, and we would always count on her love and support. My father had a good job as an industrial photographer, and although we always had plenty of food, money was very tight. My younger brother Peter was born when I was nine. We had to divide six people into a small two-bedroom garden apartment. Life in this small apartment was hectic and noisy, and I sought refuge in my books I read endlessly when not playing baseball or basketball, my other childhood passions. I knew that education was my path out of the small town, comfortable as it was, I was always first or second in my class. By the time I received a full scholarship in Columbia University, I was a serious and studious young man. Academic success continued to come easily. I majored in chemistry and was graduated with honors. I decided to become a psychiatrist because the field combined my interest in science and my fascination with the working of the human mind. In addition, a career in medicine would allow me to express my concern 
and compassion for other people. In the meantime, I had met Carol during a summer vacation at the Catskill Mountain Hotel, where I was working at a, as a busy uh, as a bus boy, and she was a guest. We both experienced an immediate attraction to each other and a strong sense of familiarity and comfort. We corresponded, dated, fell in love, and were engaged by my junior year at Columbia. She was both bright and beautiful. Everything seemed to be falling in place. Few young men worry about life and death, and after life, after death, especially when things are flowing smoothly, and I was no exception. I was becoming a scientist and learning to think in a logical, dispassionate, prove it kind of way. Medical school and its residency at Yale University further crystallized the scientific method. My research thesis was on brain chemistry and the role of neo neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers in the brain tissue. I joined a new breed of biological psychiatrists, those emerging the traditional psychiatric theories and techniques with the new science of brain chemistry. I wrote many scientific papers, lectured at local and national conferences, and became quite a hotshot in my field. I was a bit obsessive, intense, and inflexible. But these were useful traits in a physician. I felt totally prepared to treat any person who walked into my office for therapy. Then, Catherine became a Rhonda, a young girl who had lived in 1863 BC or was, in, or was it the other way around? And here she was again, happier than I had ever seen her. I again worried that Catherine might be afraid to continue. However, she eagerly prepared for the hypnosis event under quickly. I'm throwing wreaths of flowers on the water. This is a ceremony. My hair is blonde and braided and I'm wearing a brown dress with gold and sandals and nobody has died. Somebody in the royal house, the mother, and somebody had died. Somebody in the royal house, the mother. I'm a servant with the royal house and I help with the food. We put the bodies in brine for 30 days then dry out and the parts are taken out. I can smell it, smell the bodies. She had spontaneously gone back to Aronda's lifetime, but to a different part of it, when her duty was to prepare bodies after their death. In a separate building, Catherine continued, I can see the bodies, we are wrapping bodies, the soul passes on, you take your belongings with you to be prepared for the next and greater life. She was expressing what seemed like an Egyptian concept of death and the afterlife, different from any of our beliefs. In that religion, you could take it with you. She left the lifetimes and rested. She paused for several minutes before entering an apparently ancient time. I see eyes hanging in a cave, rocks. She vaguely described a dark and miserable place and she was now visibly uncomfortable. Later, she described that she had seen of herself. I was ugly, dirty, smelly. She left for another time. There were some buildings and a cart with stone wheels. My hair is brown with a cloth on it. The cart has straw in it. I am happy. My father is there. He's hugging me. It's Edward, the pediatrician, who insisted she see me. He is my father. He will live in a valley with trees. There are olive and fig trees in the yard. People write on paper. There are funny marks on them, like letters. People are writing all day, making a library. It's a 1536 BC. The land is barren. My father's name is Perseus. The year did not fit exactly, but I was sure she was in the same lifetime that she had reported in the previous week's session. I took her ahead in time, saying in that lifetime, My father knows you, meaning me. You and he talked about crops, law and government. He says you are very smart and I should listen to you. I took her further ahead in time. He is lying in a dark room. He is old and sick. It's cold. I feel so empty. She went ahead of her death. Now I am old and feeble. My daughter is there near my bed. My husband is already dead. My daughter's husband is there too and their children. There are many people around. Her death was peaceful this time. She was floating, floating. This reminded me of Dr. Raymond Moody's studies of victims of near-death experiences. His objects also remembered floating, then being pulled back to their bodies. I had read his book several years previously and now made a mental note to reread it. I wondered if Catherine could remember anything more after her death, but she could only say, I'm just floating. I awakened her and ended the session. With the 
new insatiable hunger for any scientific papers that had been published and on reincarnation i hunted through the medical libraries i studied the works of ian stevenson md a well respected professor of psychiatry at the university of virginia who was published extensively in the psychiatric literature dr stevenson had collected over 2000 examples of children with reincarnation type memories experiences many exhibited xenoglossy the xenoglossy the ability to speak a foreign language to which they were never exposed his case reports are carefully complete well researched and truly remarkable i read an excellent scientific overview by edgar michel with great interest examined the esp data from duke university and the writings of professor c j ducasi of brown university and i intently analyzed the studies of dr martin eben dr helen wombach dr gertrude skymilder dr frederick lenz and dr edith flor the more i read the more i wanted to read i began to realize that even though i had considered myself well educated about every dimension of the mind my education had been very limited there are libraries filled with this research and literature and few people know about it much of this research was conducted verified replicated by reputed clinicians and scientists could this all be mistaken could they all be mistaken or deceived the evidence seemed to be overwhelmingly supportive yet i still doubted overwhelming or not i found it difficult to believe both catherine and i in our own ways had already been profoundly affected by the experience catherine was improving emotionally and i was expanding the horizons of my mind catherine had been tormented by the fears for many years and she was finally feeling some relief whether through the actual memories or vivid fantasies i had found a way to help her and i was not going to stop now for a brief moment i thought about all of this as catherine drifted into a trance at the beginning of the next session prior to the hypnotic induction she had related a dream about a game being played on old stone steps a game played with a checkboard with holes in it the dream had seemed especially vivid to her i now told her to go back beyond the normal limits of space and time and to go back and see if the dream had roots in a previous reincarnation I see steps leading up to a tower overlooking the mountains but also the sea I am a boy my hair is blonde strange hair the clothes are short brown and white made from animal skins some in on top of the tower looking out guards they are dirty they play a game like checkers but not the board is round not square they play with sharp dagger like pieces which fit into the holes pieces of animal heads on them Kirustan phonetic spelling territory from from the Netherlands around 1473 I asked her the name of the place in which she lived whether she could see or hear her ear I'm in a seaport now the land goes by to the sea there's a fortress and and water I see a hut my mother cooking in a clay pot my name is Johan she was progressed to her death At this point in our session I was still looking for the single overwhelming traumatic ev- event that could either cause or explain her current life symptoms even if these remarkably explicit visualizations were fantasies and I was unsure of this what she believed or thought could still underlie her symptoms after all I had seen people traumatized by the dreams some could not remember whether childhood trauma actually happened or occurred in the dream yet the memory of that trauma still haunted the adult lives what i didn't fully appreciate was that the steady day in and day out pounding of undermining influences such as a partner's scathing criticisms could cause even more psychological trauma than a single traumatic event these damaging influences because they blend into the everyday background of our lives are even more difficult to remember and exercise I a constantly criticized child can lose as much confidence and self-esteem as one who remembers being humiliated on one particular horrifying day. A child whose family is is, is impoverished in is impoverished and has 
very little food available on a day-to-day -day basis might eventually suffer from the same psychological problems as a child who experienced one major episode of accidental near starvation. I, I would soon realize that the day in and day out pounding of negative forces had to be recognized and resolved with as much attention as that paid to the single overwhelmingly traumatic event. Catherine began to speak. There are boats like canoes, brightly painted, Providence area. We have weapons, spears, slings, bows, arrows, but bigger. There are big, strange oars on the boat. Everyone has to row. We may be lost. It is dark. There are no lights, I'm afraid. There are other boats with us, apparently a raiding party. I'm afraid of the animals. We sleep on dirty, foul-smelling animal skills we are scouting. My shoes look funny like sacks tied at the ankles from animals' skins. Long paws. My face is hot from the fire. My people are killing the others and I am not. I do not want to kill. My knife is in my hand. Suddenly she began to gurgle and gasp for breath. She reported the enemy fighter had grabbed her from behind, around the neck and had slit her throat with his knife. She saw the face of a killer before she died. It was Stuart. He looked different then, but she knew it was he. Johan had died at the age of 21. She next found herself floating above her body, observing the scene below. She drifted up to the clouds, feeling perplexed and confused. Soon she felt herself being pulled into a tiny, warm space. She was about to be born. Somebody is holding me, she whispered slowly and dreaming. Somebody who helped with the birth. She's wearing a green dress with a white apron. She has a white hat folded back at the corners. The room has funny windows, many sections. The building is stone. My mother has long dark hair. She wants to hold me. There's a, there's a funny rough nightshirt on my mother. It turns to It hurts to rub against it. It feels good to be in the sun and to be warm again. It's the same mother I have now. During the previous session, I had instructed her to closely observe the significant people in these lifetimes to see whether they could identify them as significant people in her present lifetime as Catherine. According to most writers, groups of souls tend to reincarnate together again and again, working out their karma, debts owed to others and to the self, lessons to be learned over the span of many lifetimes. Understand this again and again. हम सोल फैमिलीज के साथ क्यों रीबर्थ लेते हैं मोस्टली टू वर्क ऑन द कार्मिक डेथ्स मोस्टली टू वर्क ऑन न्यू लेसन मोस्टली टू टू रिमूव द रेपिटेटिव लूप दैट वी आर लिविंग इन लाइव आफ्टर लाइव आफ्टर लाइव इन माई अटेम्प्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस स्ट्रेंज स्पेक्टैक्यूलर ड्रामा दैट इज अनफोल्डिंग अन बी नो टू द रेस्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड इज माई क्वाइट इन माई क्वाइटली डिम लिटल office i want to verify the information i felt the need to apply the scientific method which i had rigorously used over the past 15 years in my research to evaluate the most unusual material emerging from catherine's lips between sessions catherine herself was becoming increasingly more psychic she had intuitions about people and events that proved to be true during the hypnosis she had begun to anticipate my questions before i had a chance to ask them Many of her dreams had a precognitive and foretelling bent. On one occasion, when her parents came to visit her, her father expressed tremendous doubt about what was happening. To prove to him that it was true, she took him to the race track. There, right before his eyes, she proceeded to pick the winner of every race. She was stunned. He was stunned. Once she knew that she had proved her point, she took out all the money that she had won and gave it to the first poor street person she met on the way out of the track. She intuitively felt that the new spiritual power she had gained should not be used for financial reward. For her, they had a much higher meaning. She told me that the experience was a little fr less frightening to her, but she was so pleased with the progress that she had made that she was eager to continue with the regressions. I was both shocked and fascinated by his psychic abilities, especially the episode at the racetrack. 
This was tangible proof she had the winning ticket to every race. This was no coincidence. Something very odd was happening over these past several weeks and I struggled to keep my perspective. I could not deny her psychic abilities and even if these abilities were real and could produce tangible proofs, could her reincarn recitations of past life's events also be true? Now she returned to the lifetime in which she had just been born. This reincarnation, this incarnation seemed to be more recent, but she could not identify a year. Her name was Elizabeth. I am older now with a brother and two little sisters. I see the dinner, dinner, dinner table. My father is there. He is Edward the pediatrician, back for an encore performance as a father. Her mother and father are fighting again. The food is potatoes and beans. He's mad because the food is cold. They fight a lot. He's always drinking. He hits my mother. Catherine's voice was frightened and she was trembling visibly. He pushes the kids. He's not like he was before. Not the same person. I don't like him. I wish I he, he would just go away. She was speaking as a child could speak. My questioning of her during the sessions was certainly very different from what I use in conventional psychotherapy. I acted more as a guide with Catherine, trying to review an entire lifetime in an hour or two, searching for tra traumatic events and harmful patterns that might explain her current symptoms. Conventional therapy is conducted at a much more detailed and leisurely pace. Every word chosen by the patient is analyzed for nuances and hidden meanings. Every facial gesture, every bodily movement, every inflection of the voice is considered and evaluated. Every emotional reaction is carefully scrutinized. Behavior patterns are painstakingly pieced together. With Catherine, however, years would wit by in minutes. Catherine sessions were like driving the Indy 500 at full throttle and trying to pick out faces in the crowd. I returned my attention to Catherine and asked her to advance in mine. I am married now. Our house has one big room. My husband has blonde hair. I don't know him. That is, he has not appeared in Catherine's present lifetime. We have no children yet. He's very nice to me. We love each other. We are happy. Apparently, she, she had successfully escaped from the oppression of a parental home. I asked if she could identify the area in which she lived. Brennington. Catherine whispered hesitant. Hesitatingly, I see books with funny old covers. The big one closes with a strap. It's the Bible. There are big fancy letters. Gaelic language. Here she said some words I could not identify. Whether they were Gaelic or not, I had no idea. We live inland, not near the city. See, County, Brennington, I see a farm with pigs and lambs. This is our farm. She had gone ahead in time. We have two boys. The older has gone ahead in time. We have The older is getting married. I can see the church temple, uh, steeple, a very old stone building. Suddenly her head hurt and Catherine was in pain, clutching her left temple area. She reported that she had fallen on the sto stone steps and she recovered. She died at an old age in her bed at in her bed at home with the family around. She again floated out of her body after her death, but this time she was not perplexed or confused. I'm aware of a bright light. It's wonderful. You get the energy from this light. She was resting after death in between lifetimes. Minutes passed in silence. Suddenly she spoke, but not in the slow whisper she had always done previously used previously. Her voice was now husky and loud without hesitation. Our task is to learn to become godlike through knowledge. We know so little. You are here to be my teacher. I have so much to learn. By knowledge, we approach God and then we can rest. Then we come back to teach and help others. Dr. Y says he was absolutely speechless. Here was a lesson from after her death from the in-between states. There was a source of this material. This did not sound at all like Catherine. She had never spoken like this, using these words. This phraseology, even the tone of her voice was totally different. At that moment, I did not realize that although Catherine had uttered the words, she had not originated the thoughts. She was relaying what was being said to her. She later identified the master's highly evolved souls not presently in body as the source. They could speak to me through her. 
Not only could Catherine be regressed to past lifetimes, but now she could end channel knowledge from the beyond. Beautiful knowledge. I struggled to retain my objectivity. A new dimension had been introduced. Catherine had never read the studies of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross or Dr. Raymond Moody, who was both written about NDEs. She had never heard of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, yet she was relating similar experiences to those described in these writings. This was a proof of sorts. If only there were more facts, more tangible details I could verify. My skepticism fluctuated, yet remained. Maybe she had read about NDEs in magazine article or had seen an interview on the television show. Although she denied any conscious remembrance of such an article or show, perhaps she retained a subconscious memory. But she went beyond these previous writings and transmitted a message back from the in-between state if only I had more facts. After she awakened, Catherine remembered the details of her past lives as always. However, she could not remember anything that happened after her death as Elizabeth. In the future, she would never remember any details of the in-between states. She could only remember the lifetimes. By knowledge, we approach God, we were on our way. So powerful. All right, dear friends, dear co-learners, after this beautiful beginning to this magical book, let's close our eyes. Straighten your backs. If possible, just come in a resting, comfortable position. Take a deep breath in. And out. Let all anxiety, stress, tension leave your body as you breathe. Breathing out, you can release. Breathing in, you can bring in all the happiness, joy, abundance. Continue to casually, with less efforts, Consciously breathe in and consciously breathe out. Deeper breaths will help release the right hormones to induce your beautiful subconscious mind opening. So gently but effectively breathe in and out. Longer the breathing, easier the settling in. Now, as I count from 10 to 1, your mind will get prepared to open up the memories that you must tap into now, today's lesson. If you wish, you can have an intention of going into the meditation, the trance, before you go into it. What is it that you need as an answer? Take 10 seconds and pose the question to your subconscious mind. And now, after the question has been given, or the permission to just freely flow has been given, let's gently and deeply inhale and exhale. At the count of one, you would have entered and tapped into the right memory. And take as long as you can to savor it, to flow with it. Let's deeply start breathing and opening the realms of our subconscious mind. Then, we're going deeper and deeper into the right memory. Nine. 
all your anxiety, stress, tension has left you. Eight, you're more in tune with the subconscious mind, with what's unfolding around. Seven, you release all apprehension and you just want to flow with whatever is coming your way. Six, you are now getting fully prepared. Five. You're waiting expectantly and beautifully. Four. You're inching in closer and excited. Three. You feel peace already. You are ready. Three. You're on the threshold of finding something mystical, magical. Two. And you're there. One. Savor this beautiful memory. Be blessed.